Thank you very much. Uh, and my apologies for this delay, technical illiteracy. So, uh, journalism talk, my experience of talking journalism over the years has been that we tend to get overwhelmed by immediate happenings or not happenings. This morning, I do wish to suggest to this audience that it is very important to take of the media, institutional view of the media in India, and the larger context in which the media performs its job. So obviously I will not be talking right away about Sushant Rajput's murder. I have absolutely no interest, no idea who Sushant Singh is. And I must confess that I am baffled why so much of a space gets devoted to this. And now I understand this uh, murder may even affect how the outcome of the Bihar election. So let's take a somewhat long-term view. There is a tendency among very many liberal, democratic, sensitive people to think that the media story in India is almost over. So, I need to emphasize what journalism is, journalism in India, and doing journalism means. So I see journalism as a democratic institution. A media, media as an institution is part of the democratic architecture in any democratic society whose job is to scrutinize, critique in a very responsible manner, inform the citizens and its readers. Readers are all citizens. So in that context, citizens have Readers become citizens, and citizens become very important partner in the larger democratic enterprise. And at the same time, it is important that whosoever the ruler, what whatever stage of history we talk about, the rulers have always felt the need that they must put out their side of the story, and why they are doing certain things, why they are not doing certain things. But in the modern democratic context, it is, it is recognized and noted that media has a right to disrupt and dispute. The official narrative, official narrative and orthodoxy. So this is a, uh, that remains unchanged to the extent India remains a democracy. India remains committed to the concept of uh, a rule of law, a government by the consent of the people. The media will. That is the media's institutional mandate. Now, it's also very important to keep in mind that this role is not an act of charity on the part of the government of the people. Very early, we have a constitution of India that governs the basic, the most fundamental document we have in this country is the constitution of India. And the Constitution of India has an architecture and 
an important part of architecture is that citizens have certain fundamental rights, democratic rights. And very early in our constitution, when the constitution was promulgated on January 26, 1950, soon after the Supreme Court in a very major judgment called Ramesh Thapar versus State of Madras established, accepted that freedom of speech, expression, media was part of the larger speech, uh, constitutional guarantee freedom of speech. So this is a something which many of us tend to forget that the freedom we enjoy as the the mandate we enjoy is very much part of a constitutional promise and arrangement. Now, I need to emphasize one very important point because we are going to talk about the state of media today. There has, so it is important for us to remember that from the very beginning, or at least last 40 years, uh, there has been and there is bound to be a very creative tension between the government of the day and the media. Uh, the government has a, a government means the political leadership of the day in power. They have a certain preference in terms of policies and prejudices. This is the thing they are entitled to push into laws and authoritative policies. So, there would always be people who will agree or disagree with it. The role of the media is to give expression opposition voices, voice of dissent, citizens' observations, and help citizens become better informed. In fact, I think it's, we were very fortunate in the formative years of this republic that there was a prime minister who believed in communicating and explaining and making citizens a partner in what he was doing, what the government of the day was doing. And anybody who want to look at uh, the speeches of the royal in far away public places, in Haripur, in Allahabad, in uh, Coimbatore, in uh, Pune, in uh, Odisha, he will be talking about great issues of the day, not explaining them why in the international context, why India is doing so, what is the responsibility of new leadership, we are building a new India. So it, it was a very fortunate context in our uh, situation that the post-independent leadership insisted that the citizens need to be involved, have a dialogue with them, is the legitimacy of the regime of the day, of the new, derived not from they have come to power or they have captured power from the British, but because they continue to have the endorsement, acceptability, affection of the masses. So this continued and uh, Indian media, like any other media, was not functioning in the vacuum. It had a dramatic pause between 1975 and early 77, when for 17, 17, 18 months, India had what is called the emergency rule. That time, the rulers of the day were experimenting with a certain kind of authoritarianism and uh, the media was forced, in fact, 
to abandon its traditional role of critiquing and putting the government's narrative. Once the emergency was over, the Indian media, like the rest of the media in all, all over the world, in the democratic world at least, discovered the joys of a social relationship with the government. Previous to previous years, the, the relationship between the government and the media was an extremely cozy relationship. In fact, uh, um, uh, there were almost uh, very large chunks of the media during Nehru years, almost like the Sarkari media. They were a spokesperson of the government, almost positioned themselves as spokesperson of the government. They accepted uh, 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 privileges from the government. Many of them accepted ambassadorial amendments, uh, members of parliament amendments, but allowed themselves to be co opted. Yet, it's uh, the individual were doing out of a kind of, it was a joyful partnership. It was a partnership which uh, was not coerced. The certain individuals felt that the, what the new leadership was doing was something which the nation needed and the, the leadership needed to be helped. The other side of it was that those who did not join uh, in uh, being very enthusiastic cheerleaders of the government, they, they were left alone. There were no um, uh, um, negative consequences for them. In fact, uh, um, the leadership at that time had the imagination of, uh, let me put, uh, or rather say, uh, ima clever imagination that the, there should be some valves for the outlet of dissent and negatives of the community. But all that is necessary to understand, again, to emphasize the point that the media is a enjoys certain kind of constitutional protection. It functions not at the pleasure of the government of the day. It, it has a role, recognized role, in a democratic context. Okay. Now we move forward. I think, let's say, a very dramatic paradigm shift took place in in the Indian situation in 1991, when the so-called regime of uh, economic liberalization uh, was put in place. So you have, uh, that had, it did a number of things, consequences for how the media would function. Suddenly, the media opened government gave up its monopoly of uh, outlet of information. Then, uh, new, uh, especially in electronic sphere, uh, earlier we had to do with monotonous uh, Darshan, our version of the Pravda of the old Communist Party to newspaper. And now we had the multiplicity, diversification of voices, and they, those voices, more importantly, had global linkages. And suddenly, because India was experimenting with a new economic liberal regime, the expectations were that the government, as well as the people of India, 
uh, were entitled to something called good governance. Good governance meant uh, certain civilized behavior in all its of life, absence of coercion, absence of intimidation, tolerance, uh, diversity of views, uh, accountability. Uh, leaders had to explain what they were doing and why were they doing it. And so this became a part of um, the accepted larger institutional framework in which media performed. And it, it mesmerized the Indian collective imagination. Television became the uh, uh, new form of entertainment and information for the masses in this country. It's, it's starting with the educated middle class, and then next two decades, what you see the spread of regional and linguistic television into the remotest corner of India. At the same time, the print media was also flourishing as more and more people became uh, uh, prosperous, more and more people uh, uh, became literate. So in, in the starting in the 90s and 20s, you have this massive, massive explosion of vernacular, what is called the vernacular press, or let's call it the regional press, or the language press, whichever way you like, as opposed to the English press. So that globalization, context of globalization is very important to understand that Earlier, you had the media operated in a context of assurance that it is of a democratic setup. B, it has a constitutional protection. Now there was a new context. Of course, we are part of the Indian media would be like the American media or the British media or the French media, and we will be. Uh, Calling, uh, uh, calling the bluff of politicians. We'll uh, bring them to their knees. It was a new confidence. And uh, camera is very harsh. Camera, you can't lie. Or if you lie on camera, you get caught. There was nothing you can deny. In the earlier age of print media, uh, uh, anyone need, one in authority could disown or distance himself or herself from uh, the uh, what uh, something inconvenient or embarrassing he or she must have said. So the media changed in something. Uh, and I think um, uh, The governments almost felt helpless in how to deal with this new beast in town called television. And perhaps the most dramatic impression uh, of that helplessness lessness. Uh, I suggest uh, if anybody remembers the Kandahar hijacking in Closing uh, in 1999, closing the age of 1999, and how television campers were able to generate uh, a certain kind of emotional and crowd pressure on the government of the day to make concessions to the terrorist who had kidnapped, who had hijacked the plane. So uh, those were very, uh, everybody learned certain, certain lessons from that. 
the media became the indian television media became very arrogant cockily arrogant if i may say so that they have the power to make or break a government that is what is the second context in which the media eventually has to come to terms with the age began with 9/11 september 9 2001 when um, uh, the twin towers in new york city were attacked so we it became the world began a new age of terror and uh, it created a enormous amount of uh, uh, disruptive uh, dissonance about everybody in all parts of the world and india was no exception it suddenly the terror groups were able to a handful of people assume violence against targets whether government type targets or individual random acts of violence against citizens the realization don on everybody that the message would uh, uh, the established order suddenly look very very shaky citizens face in the ability of their governments to protect them give them safety create conditions of safety suddenly look very very uh shaky uh, very uncertain and in the process began uh, the demand of the forces that is the armed forces security forces paramilitary forces the police who will fight this new uh, menace to civilize adjacent in india we are if we recall uh, soon after 911 took place we had uh, a terror attack on jammu and kashmir parliament and then on december 13 uh, the indian parliament was attacked and suddenly there was this great demand that society's attention and its affection must focus on the people who are protecting us the soldier and the policeman became more important than the need and their ability to protect us became more important than uh, this democratic accountability transparency and so that phase begin has not it continues to make its demand that the citizens surrendered a bit of their liberties to the indian to the policeman and soldier if they need to be protected from a uh, unseen uh, unaccountable enemy of country and then the third context in which the media functions today uh, has come to function is uh, the enormous enormous uh, uh, expansion and inventions in communication technologies the it's um, and all 
the internet, the uh, and its consequent uh, growth of what is called growth by the name of social media has <coughs> created altogether different conditions. Been mentioned by uh, earlier in the introduction. This all combination of uh, last uh, uh, context, we need. I need to emphasize an additional factor, and that I take back to the rise of Mr. Bill Clinton as in American politics. In 1992, he became president of the United States at a very young age. And Mr. Clinton, and to be followed soon by Tony Blair in England, that became the rise of a new politician. The governments in the past have always been, of course, concerned with the media, concerned with their image, uh, concerned with uh, and, uh, ensuring that it's going to be what but here was a new breed of politician, <coughs> uh, which was uh, very much aware of the possibilities created by the faster technologies of communication. So you had uh, uh, people like Bill Clinton and Tony Blair. They were struggling. In fact, there were enormous amount of um, their time and attention was uh, devoted to keeping their image up, keeping their approval rating up, uh, keeping uh, trying to understand on almost daily basis the reaction of the people to what they're doing, what not doing, and adjusting themselves. So, it, it, in many ways, the traditional notion that the leader is there to lead the masses, not to be led by the masses' impulses and by the crowd. So that got uh, somewhat mixed up. We in India, unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, uh, were uh, moving at our own pace. Uh, starting with 90, if we take the turning point of 91 when the economy Till 2000, when Mr. Modi came to power, we had a string of leaders. Uh, Mr. Narsim Rao and, and his finance minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, then followed by a gentleman called Mr. Devi Gorda, then Mr. Ayyapur Bal, then for six years by Mr. Bajpayee, and then for 10 years by Dr. Manmohan Singh. All leaders were leaders who were comfortable with written word. They were comfortable with newspapers. They were comfortable. They have grown up. They were conditioned. And they had internalized that media meant newspapers. It meant a legally pace. Uh, and they uh, <coughs> recognized the need, understood the need that media is a very important part of democratic value, uh, and it's their duty to cultivate, talk to them, and this was so. The government's previous to 2014, the. Uh, the senior press corps in Delhi always had various degrees of access to Prime Minister and his colleagues. They were part of, they were made to feel that they were part of uh, the ruling, uh, if you want to feel like that. Then in 2014, we had an election. And Mr. Modi became our Prime Minister. Now, 
this is uh, this is Modi. Is a is a politician different than the previous uh, prime ministers we have had? Part of his <coughs> appeal, part of his strength, comes from a personality of uh, confrontation. He has. Uh, uh, achieved success and has come to dominate the national politics by pursuing a strategy of confrontation. Confront the sense of aggressively putting forward his point of view unapologetically and without feeling the need to give in to what political correctness is political And as a man, because when he was chief minister of Gujarat from 2002 to 14, he had a reason to believe that he, his record, his achievements, his politics, <coughs> his personality uh, were not very much approved and appreciated by what is called the national media. So when he came to Delhi, he, he came with a very clear uh, that he was not going to subscribe to uh, there was no need for him to subscribe to the prevailing consensus that media is is part of uh, an important part, a crucial part. Right? It needs to be uh, respected. It needed to be uh, at times appeased. So this is a the basic fundamentals Mr. Modi has brought with him. But as I said earlier, if free media in India exists, not as an act of mercy on the part of this or that government, but this is very much embedded in our constitution. And so, on the face of it, you will have, we have a situation where <coughs> the, the Modi government can claim that it has done nothing to curb the freedom of the press. Yet, at the same time, the Modi government has used its restriction to rewrite the rules of engagement. A, something very important uh, since at one time, media advisor to Prime Minister of India, um, Mr. Modi, one of the first uh, signal Mr. Modi sent out was that he is not going to appoint a media advisor. This sent out a very significant signal that he does not recognize the need for a sustained, respected, uh, honorable, open interaction between the media and, and PM, PMO, and the rest of the government. The second innovation Mr. Modi did, which had even entirely within his discretion, there was no constitutional stipulation on his part uh, or a part of, he stopped a three decade old practice of media traveling with the Prime Minister whenever he went. This was a great privilege, a great occasion for the media to travel with the Minister whenever he was on the road. It 
for one of the most sought after uh, byline would be from the Prime Minister's plane on the, on the special aircraft with the Prime Minister. And the prime, one of the protocols developed over the years was that Prime Minister would interact with the media on the board. On board. There will be at least one press conference, if not more. Uh, prime Minister will come to know face to face with number of uh, journalists different, from different parts of the country. So, there was a, a definite, without dismantling any of the legal uh, uh, protection, what the government, the new government starting in 2014 did was to chip away at the, uh, the respectability of the media. and of media personnel. So all previous to Mr. Modi, all Prime Minister had felt, and Senior Minister felt the need to cultivate the press. They thought it was very important, the dialogue is very important. And um, the routine in every ministry would be, uh, the Joint Secretaries uh, would be interacting on a regular basis, the respective correspondence of ministries. Access was provided. It was very easy. Your PIB card entitled you to uh, walk, walk into any box uh, except the Prime Minister. So it was a relationship of uh, mutual respect. Yes. And uh, older, previously the Prime, Prime Ministers would they, they will learn to gain something from what media does. I remember uh, um, uh, time I was in Hindu in the early, uh, early parts of Mr. Dr. Manmohan Sikhwa's government. My colleague Mr. Sainath wrote a series of articles on drought in uh, Maharashtra. And it was a powerful reporters, very effective. Prime Minister were reading it and reading those, I think, four or five articles. Uh, the Prime Minister decided he himself would want to go and see because what he was hearing from the officials in Maharashtra that things were not as bad as uh, it was here. So he decided he himself will go and visit. So it was a, uh, I said, this is a Minus movement of journalism that uh, you are able to highlight miseries, deprivation being done to the citizens, to the attention of rulers, and rulers have an obligation to um, try to, do, to redress the situation. So this is, uh, but as I said, Mr. Modi has come with an altogether different set of mental propositions. And those mental propositions have traveled down from PM to PMO, PMO to the rest of the government. The relationship between uh, uh, formally remains open, but uh, um, in actual terms, the, prime, um, the media has lost its uh, uh, access is to the government. Mr. Modi also has done, he is the first man to understand new technology of information. He is extremely conscious of the camera. He knows how the frame would look and he is very good at uh, adapting himself. But more important than that, he, he understands the uh, I, uh, what social media uh, opportunities social media provides to any person, more so to the Prime Minister or to the government, in reaching out to the people. Um, 
bypassing the established uh, intermediary uh, roles of the media. As a purely as a theoretical proposition, it's very difficult to argue with that because if a prime, if a ruler, whether he's a prime minister or an autocrat or whatever, democratic elected man, uh, if he want, if he want to com communicate with the masses, and he's able to communicate with the masses, uh, this is what ultimately democracy is all about. Uh, where uh, it's mandated that a president or a prime minister have to necessarily go through. Uh, at the same time, the same technology allows um, the regime's opponents also to have their say. But Mr. Modi, as prime minister, uh, has also found a way to exploit the vulnerabilities in the revenue model of the present day media. Most media, running a newspaper, running a television channel is becoming an extremely expensive proposition. New money is needed, large chunks of money is Needed. There are very few newspapers in India who are uh, make profit. On most of them, newspapers organizations are associated, unfortunately, with uh, this or that business house, and that business house itself may have its vulnerabilities, and they are uh, they don't have. Publish no longer have, if they ever had the confidence to tell, to register the government's pressure. And that pressure from the rev of revenue uh, gathering, making it a profitable venture. Because no newspaper can forever run into a, into a, a, a loss making project. It will need, uh, somebody will have to build it out. So this is a, um, uh, Mr. Modi has been very good in uh, uh, using them. Before I conclude for the now, again, I need to emphasize that Mr. Modi is able to do all that because of, of his certain physical dominance at the moment. If tomorrow we have a Prime Minister who instead of uh, having 300 seats in the Parliament looks up under his belt, is, has only 185 or two seats, the nature of power uh, will change. How the power is um, the very nature of Prime Ministerial authority will change. The Prime Minister will have to share power with his colleagues in the cabinet, in his own party, with other uh, stakeholders in his political project. So, um, uh, there is a built-in uh, dilemma, a strong, strong Prime to the strong parliament in the uh, ipso facto acquires a dominance not just in the entire, in the entire uh, constitutional system, political system. And it, uh, that dominance is reflected through the parliament, over other institutions, over uh, uh, in many cases over the bench. And media is no exception. So it's a, um, uh, it's a, in many ways, what media can do and cannot do, uh, also get 
defined by the political realities of the day. Of course, in a democratic country, in an established democratic system, uh, and certain institutional boundaries are should be sacrosanct. And I, again, I need to emphasize that in India, a free press is very much part of the our constitutional architecture. And Mr. Modi uh, has and not and cannot dismantle that constitutional architecture. It's for the rest of it, it's a challenge uh, for those who are journalists, those who choose to be journalists or want to be journalists, uh, want to run newspapers, want to run television channels. And you have to find, uh, especially young people, if you want to be journalists, you must uh, be prepared to stay the course, understand, realize that uh, every time you uh, annoy someone in powerful authority, doesn't matter who the Prime Minister of India is, there may be some consequences. But be prepared for that. I'll stop at that and be happy to have conversation questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr. Kare.